How have you enabled your infrastructure fundamental change over the last five years and partnering with the business is, is critical. The tools exist on the cloud, change at the rate necessary, secure by design. Network Disrupted. Hey, it's Andrew and welcome to Network Disrupted, where IT leaders talk about navigating the disruption in our industry. In this episode, we talk with our guest, Chad Sheridan, former service delivery chief at the USDA, about how to drive innovation in the federal space. Chad recently moved to work at Net Impact Strategies as Chief Innovation Officer to advise a number of agencies on what we're about to talk about. That is, creating and measuring value in the federal context, switching from a project to a product-based thinking to nurture innovation, the cloud's value for agencies, and how to lean on peers to overcome the challenges that inevitably come up with the territory of technology leadership. You can find Chad at Chad F. Sheridan on Twitter, or Chad Sheridan on LinkedIn. Let me know what you thought of this episode. You can tweet me at Network Disrupted, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or email me at Andrew at NetworkDisrupted.com. So Chad, thank you for joining me on Network Disrupted. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. So we, we had a conversation before, which I thought was really interesting and certainly very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, and that is... Um, starting to look at programs in IT more horizontally, uh, moving away from project-based or program-based IT um, that in its nature drives silos and start really trying to understand how to look at, at value and results of a broader program and, and planning for that. And, um, and obviously, you're very passionate about it too. So maybe give me some background about why you're so passionate about these sorts of things and what you've seen in, in, uh, in the U.S. government, for instance, that's sort of driven you to your role today, really trying to understand how to work with businesses to build higher value, higher impact programs. I think it started with, um, you know, I had the good fortune of working when I started in government for an outfit that ran Naval Nuclear Propulsion, uh, has been around for over 60 years. And so we were, I think the people that were selected for that program and those who survived the initial five-year job trial, because everybody's brought in original as military and you kind of have a five-year uh job trial, a five-year interview, and then they decide to keep you on as a civilian or an engineering duty officer. And all of the people that stayed on had this cradle-to-grave understanding and approach to nuclear power. And so it's it's kind of part of my being. And so I, I came over to other parts of government and started working in IT. And I saw this siloed approach to thinking that that just gave me a you know the blue screen of death in my brain around this doesn't make sense i don't understand this why don't you people see the world the way i see the see the world and so i spent the remainder of my federal career trying to break down the barriers of going hey i know your program is independently authorized and appropriated and so you only see the world from this silo but your customers the citizens don't care that you do crop insurance and you do farm programs. They care about how it impacts their farm. And so trying to break down the barriers that keep from keep government agencies from delivering to the citizen uh, has been kind of my my charge, both from how I grew up in my first jobs with the government um, and and through my first agency and and department of agriculture again i had the good fortune that it was an agency had that that had a single federal program federal crop insurance and so i i guess by nature and nurture i learned how to think holistically and then as i i jumped into a, a job that had goodness three agency three bureaus within usda 40 to 50 individual programs and then having worked with other federal agencies, I, I guess I, I saw the world from a horizontal before people were talking about it. There's always a challenge to measure the output. And, you know, if that's something as potentially hard to define as customer value, some things have obvious customer value. Um, it, it costs us $3,000 to do that. Now it costs $5. We do that 
500 times a year, fantastic. There's an ROI. Um, many, many things, the ROI is either harder to find or the value is harder to find or it's over a number of years or it's only appreciated by the next program. So it's hard to measure yours. Maybe give me some strategies how you think about measuring value from some of these larger initiatives that, that give the business owners the ability to justify actually doing this stuff. Um, we had the great fortune. I think one of the things you can do in a larger agency or in any agency for that matter is understand where your people are spending their time. So we had an effort going on in USDA uh, focused on the what was called the optimally productive office. And the, the effort that went into that was actually first kicked off to justify the hiring plans that we had put in place because the secretary was was very keen on measures and was not going to let us do a lot of hiring in the field unless we had some objective measures of what those people were doing. And so right. what that ended up giving us was I knew by types of programs where the field was spending the most time. So I could start to develop investment portfolios to say, if I could reduce, right, we had anecdotal knowledge that that this process is onerous and hard. I had a, I had quantitative measures that said I was spending 15% of the field staff's time on these activities. So I could say, we know they're saying qualitatively this sucks. Quantitatively, we know we're spending this amount of time and over a 10,000 person field staff, if I could make a 10% improvement in this by investing, then I'm going to get value output. Now, the sale that we had to change with that, and I actually got to pitch this to the secretary before I left, was to pitch the value proposition. In other words, if I can deliver better value through the field, not by reducing their hours, but by increasing the value they deliver, I'm going to get the return on the investment, even if I'm not going to use that to cut the staff's time. Right. Right. That because typically what happens is you go make those investments and then the budget people come back and say, well, we're going to cut your staff by 10 percent because you're more efficient. Well, most people in industry don't in, they invest in value up the upside versus the downside. It doesn't mean that the downside and cost savings don't matter, but there are very few mergers and acquisitions that are not targeted towards that upside versus the downside. And so I pitched that to the secretary and said, look, there's value here. He said, he said, those folks on the Hill aren't necessarily going to understand this, but I see where you're coming from. I'm willing to back because you've got definitive measures of what you're going to do. You've shown some, you've shown cap capability to deliver and you've got qualitative and quantitative measures of why this matters. So that yeah, I think is where right. we can make a difference in government is, is find ways to to go after the value proposition, the upside value versus just the downside value. Yeah, no, for sure. Because you know, because it, it's it's just look, everything always comes down to trade offs and priorities, right? And yeah. uh, and we see this all the time in in software development. Um, you know, there are things you can do. Um, I don't know. Uh, rework an entire build system, for instance, which is going to save you nine hours every week of build time and developers will have faster access to whether something worked or not, or, you know, switch over to CI CD pipelines and get gain all these benefits. All the work in that is instead of building some features that customers want. And so you get into this, um, are we investing in being able to do more stuff later or are we investing in more stuff now? And that sort of trade off with a fixed amount of staff, even with, the value of, okay, these people be more efficient. Um, it's still hard to justify, right? Yeah, it, it, it actually, that's, that's a, that's a huge trade-off because typically the, the focus has always been on prioritization of features over the sustainable delivery of value. And so right. you have to change the conversation. And we had a great opportunity to um, talk about technical debt, 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 technical debt with some of our leaders. And, and so I had a, a senior career person asked, what is this, you know, program person, 
what is technical debt? And one of my architects explained it perfectly. He said, really technical debt is the impediments for the continued rapid delivery of value, you know, by the way in which we code it. And he's like, oh, so if I did this to rapidly get a program in place, I need to go and refactor that so that doesn't gum up the works for my ability to change that program or deliver it in the future. So it's about, again, taking the terms that we might understand in technology delivery and turn them into understanding of future capabilities in the minds of the program people. Yeah, no. And, and th- those are just, those are always difficult conversations to have mm-hmm. because you, you can refactor something with all your capacity all the time and never get back around to features if you want well, to, you know, it, I think it, it comes back to, I think we tend to focus on the new delivery of features as the big, that's where all the money goes. Well, that's, that's right. That's where all that new investment money goes. But the reality is, is your capacity to continue delivering those new capabilities is dependent on everything underneath the waterline on that iceberg. Yeah. That is the technical debt, the legacy yeah. systems, all of those other things. And if you don't integrally, integrally, if I can say that word, deliver that as you're delivering features, then you're just building more of the iceberg underneath the surface and eventually it'll swallow you whole. No, for sure. And, and there, there's, there's always a balance there. And, and, and the technical debt exists because we've always prioritized features and trying to get them out on specific dates. And so we're, we do just continue doing what we've always done. And therefore I'm going to need more people over more time to deliver more compa- It gets more and more like, I like a measure of, of the cost of change, you know, and, and if I can reduce the cost of change, that will speed up my ability to deliver new capabilities. But the costs of change are are high um, when when things aren't testable or um, you know things aren't automatable. I need people involved. I need whatever the case might be. All those different impediments. Um, each one of them represents lost opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's just in fighting that cost of change there's potential lost opportunities. And, and yeah, so if you can get the business and the business leadership to buy in to what these measures are and prove, I don't know from your experience and my experience, you know, um, uh, start, start with some small things and prove so that you can justify larger spends on, on trying to, um, trying to uh, adapt or, or take technology and, and, and allow it to be changed faster. Sometimes small wins help there, no? Well, I think also, uh, you know, that's where that mind, that mindset shift from project to product is, is very important. The reality is, is these government programs, at least my experience, um, especially in the Department of Ag, but I think everywhere across the federal government landscape, these programs are multi-decade in origin for the most part, right? They, there are very few programs that start and stop and are, you know, just like that. They're, you yeah. know, they are they are decades type programs. And so if you think of this product line of a program, think of the technology that goes with that, the business processes that go with that. There should be a continuous improvement cycle of managing that product line throughout its life cycle. And so it shouldn't just be a big invest to get it out there up front. It should be, I'm continually going after right. this. And if you can make that shift, kind of that flip over from, from, from the tottering vertical to the continuous horizontal, then you can start to justify the continuing flow of ideas, which does a whole lot of things. It does. It helps your technology portfolio. It actually helps your people portfolio because you're continuously growing your product and program personnel over time because you're constantly rethinking your business processes. I don't know how many times I've gone into a program and you're spelunking through code trying to figure out these hidden business processes that no one wrote down or the person that understood it retired two years ago. And and so this continuing capability is, is, you know, it breeds a constant refresh of ideas it gets people juiced up um and it makes them own it right no i think that's critical um and that just just that engagement with 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 your people in general um over time it, it it's uh 
you know, th there's, we've been talking a lot about sort of the, that application layer, the, the layer that, that, you know, where you're going to interact with that end customer, the, the consumer, the farmer, the whoever the case might be. Um, there's also sort of the broad investments in infrastructure that go under that, that are able to hopefully deliver across multiple programs or projects or products inside of an organization um, and sort of servitizing the infrastructure as well versus the old way where, you know, you're going to install a new purchasing system that requires, I don't know, eight servers and this amount of storage for backup and these network pipes and, you know, a, a project documents written with an SLA and it's handed off to different people. They go build it. And then now you've got those eight servers dedicated to this, right? Uh, you, you were, you were, verticalizing everything from infrastructure to application. So how do you, um, how did you look across infrastructure requirements or, or security requirements or other things that, that by nature should go across programs, but, but historically were still thought of from a project standpoint? I, I think, you know, this is where I was, have been a cloud proponent for years and years and years from the standpoint of, I need an infrastructure operated by an organization that their entire life is about managing. Even if it's as, let's say I go to the lowest layer, right? Infrastructure as a service, right? The providers I can choose from and infrastructure as a service are going to deliver that capability, are going to allow me to scale up and scale down 10 times better than I'm able to buy myself and the federal government. This, this is the reality. And so if I can get to a point where I can take at a minimum my general compute to a GovCloud or a commercial cloud, we were actually driving towards a commercial cloud, FedRAMP, but commercial cloud because I could get, even with lift and shift, I could start to see advantages before I got into a uh, better level of CICD or continuous delivery. Right. I can get advantages with commercial cloud right out of the gate. And yeah, because so, I think I think commercial cloud, at least from an AWS standpoint, is FedRAMP authorized to medium level. Yep, right? There's yep. no reason so to go I to can get cloud. moderate right. workloads in commercial cloud, mm -hmm. and I can do so by extending my general support uh, accreditation boundary there. And we were working with a company, USDA, and I'm, I'm actually working with them a little bit in my new capacity. If I can speed the adoption and reduce the overall cost of ownership of that ATO in the cloud environment, especially if it's one where my boundary encompasses my on-prem and my cloud services, that's a huge advantage because I can start to move workloads and get the, the advantages of scale and I can get out of the data center business because frankly, as a federal government entity, there are very few federal government data center providers that are going to give you a better product than your major cloud service providers. Sorry, right. that's just, we, we can't hire those people <laughs> that Google's and, and Amazon's and, and Microsoft's can hire and maintain that skill set as well as they can. Right. It, it, it. May, maybe it's part that, but it's also part, you know, those data centers have been managed for quite a long time. And the contracts that exist are either cost plus contracts or yep. like they may have made sense when they were signed years ago, but now they're, they're the contracts themselves almost limit the ability or to they're deliver working cloud capital services. Funds funded and, and I, Right, there's only way for me to get better is generally by getting more. Um, the the amount of investment to innovate and become and give out better services, it's not nearly as strong. And right. and frankly, I look at their business model as more people go to cloud services is how are their costs not going to go through the roof? It's just the cycle time for improvement and change. There's not a value proposition there, whereas. Commercial cloud providers, whether they're in the Gov Cloud space, the the IL, right, the 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 IC space, or or commercial cloud space, there is an incentive to innovate, right? To constantly provide new services. There's yeah. enough customers there that are demanding new capabilities that you know right, your innovation cycles are moving, you know, at an order of magnitude or more faster than what you can do if you're working your own data center. Right. Yeah. Somebody's innovating. Somebody's innovating. Somebody's innovating underneath you, and um, and and therefore over time you'll naturally have more services you can use. 
um, right. as those services are available. And, and you may decide to use those services or build your own on the cloud. But, you know, if you want to get started with, I don't know, data warehousing, then don't spend any time. Yeah, you know, there's a data warehouse. There's a database specifically for that. And, and there's something you can at least experiment with. It's available well, and they're, they're it innovating. It also allows us to get into the right space of OpEx versus CapEx, right? I mean, part of the part of the the technical debt that's held people back is the need to throw big chunks of money at technical refresh, right? Hardware technical refresh, in lieu of hey, if I can opex that, right? That gives me a better value proposition. I have more control over that, and it it keeps me from doing a penny wise and pound foolish decision of trying to extend the service life of something that really should have been refreshed two years ago. Yeah, no, f for sure. And from a security standpoint, from a exactly, quality right. reliability standpoint, um, yeah, there, there's wins all over the place. Yeah, but we're, we're, you know, our customer base, um, th there's lots of cloud adoption and hybrid cloud adoption. Uh, in our large financial customers, there's, there's still a lot of, uh, uh, they're building their own cloud-like services, but they're able to hire those people to build those services. Mm -hmm. And so for them, um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily adopting cloud at the same uh, public cloud providers at the same speed, but are creating that same underlying infrastructure as a service and platform services so that those that are building, deploying applications and services can do it rapidly. And I, I think it's, it's obviously a critical part. If you're going to do any sort of CI, CD, you need infrastructure that you can wield with software, um, you know, that, that isn't dependent on, on, you know, something like a, a hardware refresh to get uh, faster networking so that you can execute this versus just using a different instance type, for instance, in AWS or whatever the case might be. Um, it's a, it's a, from a software developer standpoint, it's a playground, um, which can get you into trouble. So obviously there's, yeah. there's, there's processes and practices required. You don't want to create well, messes, but. I think that's where the, you know, really the front end and the business of the office of the CIO matters, right? The, the governing and way in which, um, I'm very happy to be where I'm at right now is we have capabilities in that space that at least in my journey towards continuous delivery, agile transformation, all that stuff, what I found was it doesn't matter how well you perform in the development and operate portion of that. If you don't have a governance and picking model that is more akin with agile principles, you'll never get off the ground or you're su you'll sub-optimize your process. So I'm really happy to, to bring this idea of if I understand how to govern and manage the finance and business of technology and investing, mm -hmm. and I start to do that with a set of agile principles and continuous improvement principles and lean, all of those, all of those things, there's a huge value proposition that actually is as valuable or more valuable than doing it on the delivery side. Yeah, There's totally the, understood. Using the iron triangle on one side and you're trying to be yeah. agile on another, you're setting everybody up right. to fail. No, for sure. And and that was part of like, you know, the in the early days when when we talked about agile and it was really just about how we developed software. And you didn't have quote unquote executive buy-in. But the executive buy-in that we went for those days were the execs just say, Okay, great you're doing your agile transformation. Here's some money for some consultants and uh, we're looking forward to the results versus um, understanding it from a, a business standpoint, a finance standpoint, a, you know, it, it, this isn't just how we're going to build software differently. We're, this is how we're going to engage with the market differently, but mm -hmm. also, um, also just at the, how we're going to run the business of software development or run the business of it. We need to run it and measure it differently to support yep. being able to do these things. It's not just about hiring scrum masters and, and creating teams. No, it's, it's, it's really a whole, it's, it's the locus of your transformation of your whole business. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so now, now you're the chief innovation officer at Net Impact Strategies, which, which gives you the ability to work across. Does Net Impact is is mostly uh, government focused or yeah, commercial? It's, it's focused all federal well? government. It's all federal uh, government. Some commercial, but but our our focus is the federal government clients. Uh, we've got a pretty heavy investment in the health community, federal health uh, 
community. Uh, we've also got a heavy investment in financial oversight agencies, and I think we'll be continuing to branch out there. But yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, our, our job is to to take what has been. I think the whole essence of the company was started with uh, somebody who had worked in some of the larger uh, federal systems integrators or product areas and the dissatisfaction with the ability to focus on mission and focus on the customer value. So I'm very happy in that our, our DNA is about focusing on the needs of our customers, which goes back to my vision of focusing not just on the business of IT, but on the mission delivery and what technology brings. So I feel like we have an opportunity here to change through our customers what they can do to drive their mission value. Right. And it must be, it must be, um, it's a different perspective. I mean, I, I uh, when I created my first startup, I, I was working for several years at, uh, at Motorola or a company that Motorola bought and um, doing something, trying to make success, doing all this engineering, manufacturing, supply chain stuff and software. And, and, uh, and when I left to create my startup, I, start, I funded the startup by creating a management consulting company. And so the original product was just man- doing what I knew how to do at one company and trying to do it across many companies. And then that turned into eventually our product idea and we built something. But the point being, it was, you know, I had talked to other companies all the time when I was working in industry, trying to do these things, but the amount I learned and the perspective I had now actually working as a partner to these other companies and learning the, the you know, it, from a broad brush, yeah, they're high-tech electronics companies. One makes cable boxes and one makes laptops. Things aren't going to be that different, but obviously there's a massive difference between different companies and their cultures and their processes and I would imagine it's less extreme in in Fed just because of cross cutting policies and practices that in many cases have to be there. But still, it must be fascinating to work with multiple agencies and and uh, and and you know you probably learn from that perspective. I guess is my point. Yeah, I, I had a. Uh... Lots of opportunities when I was with the federal government, I, I tended to, to branch outside of my agency and talk to other feds. Um, sometimes that's rare, but I, I just, I don't know how not to do that. Right. So I spent a lot of time connecting across federal agencies and working on cross agency initiatives. I think also there are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences. I think um, it's very easy for uh, the government to get, uh, single focused on their own programs and missions and right. not look across the horizontal. So part of my opportunity now is I can bring good ideas from one to another, um, not just for the purposes of obviously we want to grow our revenue, but, but also to, Hey, maybe I can speak your journey and maybe not everybody has to burn their hand the same way on the same stove. Um, it's human yeah. nature to learn from your own mistakes. The The higher value proposition is to start to learn from others. I don't think there's ever any perfect venue for learning from others' mistakes other than maybe I won't make quite as many as Chad did. Um, that's at least the beginning of the hope. Right, right. No, I, I, th- I think it's, yeah, I mean, learning from others' mistakes or learning from our own mistakes is, is obviously how we learn or a huge part of how we learn regardless. And, and you can't, really have wisdom unless you've done something, you know, and it, it's, it's, um, it's apparent, I think, when working with different consulting companies over the years, management consulting or otherwise, um, if they've hired consultants who know how to teach something or talk about something versus working with companies where those that you're um, specifically, you know, working with have done the job and, and, and are of the mindset that, they might not know everything. And I think, I think um, it, it used to, sometimes it was a, uh, just to work for a, a public company. And um, there were times we would have to bring in a consultant because it wasn't good enough. If it was our idea, right. we needed the third party to come in to let the CEO know that, ah, well, McKinsey 
here's what McKinsey thinks about it. Forget what my idea was. Here's what McKinsey thinks about it because now I've had a third party come in and help. And, and that was just the cost of doing business and, oh, and pay for respectability. Yes. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> um, sometimes you, you'd bring in consultants and people would, would be like, you know, had you just let us do this, we would have been able to do this. You know, some, my point is sometimes it's not met with um, the like, okay, the person who bought your services is of, of is bought in, but yep. not necessarily across the organization. So I'm just, you know, well, that, I mean, that's, that's the, the fun part of organizational change and strategy. I, I, I made a career out of uh, being a magnet or a driver of change. And I think what I try to tell people when, when I'm mentoring them or help them understand what works is right. You've got to, you know, you got to play the field as it lies, right? And play the ball as it lies, right? The, the frontal approach, right? You can come in and, and beat on people with your ideas until you're blue in the face. And the key is influence, right? I think people don't understand that you've got to learn this idea of how to make them believe it's their own. How do you do what I used to call the Jedi mind trick, right? It's how do you, how do you pull off the, the the influence of idea the inception of an idea and it becomes uh, their own i i had the great fortune to work with one of the best uh influencers and jedi mind trickers available that took what could have been a program killing rumsfeld review if you remember back when rumsfeld was secretary of defense right the rumsfeld review was the kiss of death well, we went into one of those on a huge acquisition program and then came out of it with an extra $2 billion for development <laughs> to be more transformational. So, and that was a Jedi mind trick. It was his idea, but I know where it started. So this idea that you can influence, I guess the, the, the thing I would say that's most important when I try to teach people of how do you drive change, raise right, two or three tenants that are most important. One is, there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. I mean, that's not my original, but that's a mindset, right? If you embrace yeah. that, doesn't matter who gets the credit. What matters is the mission, right? There's something greater than us that there are multiple ways to go through that. And, and persistence is more valuable than, than uh, what you can accomplish in one right? There's always resistance to change. It's whether or not you can deal with the inevitable pain um, and slings and falsehoods and lies and beat downs you're going to get in in trying to champion change. What matters is the proposition of value for the mission, that it doesn't matter who gets the credit and that, hey, I don't care how many times they slander you as that bad guy who's just trying to to change everything as long as it moves right and you know you don't let them see you sweat i don't know how many meetings i sat in where i'm just getting crushed and people throwing rocks at me from five different directions and walk out of the meeting and and some of my folks go how did you take that it's like it's not about me Right. I mean, right. It's not about me. They can yeah. slander me and call me whatever name they want until the calcs come home. As long as ultimately we continue with the mission. If if I you know take my beatings now, it might uh, you know. And if they see that that's not going to stop me, that's not going to stop us in driving this value, then the resistance melts away. Plus, they start to look like the bad guys. Right. No, for sure. And look, that, that's, that's, I think it's, it's hard. I mean, certainly an, an attribute of a leader, but it, it's hard for a lot of people to get there, which is being able to separate criticisms of what you're doing from criticisms of you as a person. Yep. Those are two very different things. And if while people are giving you whatever, however it's delivered, critical feedback. Uh, it might be delivered in a, an emotional way. It might be, might certainly sound personal, but if you can sit there, the, the mind of what's actually being criticized here is, is my program and what can I learn from this or how do I drive through this or what am I not giving my stakeholders such that they're so confused and staying in that mindset of, of, um, of this being about what you're doing, not who you are 
is is I think critical. What's that seeking to understand? I want to understand yeah. the yeah. environment, the problem, the people. Yep. You might I I may think that person is a jerk and yeah. they're they're playing dirty pool or or they're just afraid of everything and so that okay, let me understand how can I work yeah. to understand and influence and for sure. Yeah, and, and keep asking questions hard. and being curious, right? Yeah, and I think no, it does. I think that's the 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 other piece is and I'm I'm looking forward to in, in this gig and working with our customers is um to let them know, at least for the ones that are trying to drive the change, you're not alone. Um, we're here for you. We're here to be a part of it. We're here to own that with you, to partner with you. I think the biggest thing I learned is the value of peer networks. So part of what I'm trying to bring uh, in this environment is make sure we stand a clear peer network, whether it's within our company or across our partners, both technology partners and other provider partners or just the larger kind of the unwritten community of, of, of uh, people wanting to do good is how do we stay together? How do we uh, reach out to each other? How do we support each other? I mean, now more than ever, as we're all barricaded into our homes, right? How do you keep these peer networks going? Because I found that when you're one of those people that naturally goes to driving change, um, the loss of peers is probably the biggest detractor for the continuing en energy to drive change, right? You can have all the support from above, you have a great team below you, but when you lack peers that are in it with you, um, all of a sudden it gets really lonely out there. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. The energy levels necessary to continue to drive positive change. Yep. Right. You, you, you basically burn out about 10 times faster if you lack that peer now. Yeah. And sometimes it's just, it's sometimes you just need a shoulder to cry. You need to go into somebody's office and say, man, I just, some days I just can't do this. You know, what a fucking meeting we just had, you know, like, yep. and yep. you just, you, you need somebody who can empathize, somebody who's, who understands what you're going through that can then turn around and they don't even have to cheer. Sometimes they just need to listen. But yeah, that, I think that, that peer network is, is 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 critical and um and it's uh, really it's really yeah. hard for those for executives right what i've found and i'm not, I'm not sitting there crying crying to my beverage about the plight of executives but what i find and i watch having watched a lot of executives in government right they get into that job and they're supposed to know everything right, right. they're supposed to be in charge and and inevitably they stop asking people for help because they think they're supposed to know it. And, and man, does that just tear people apart? If you can't get through that barrier of, I don't know everything, and so I'm going to ask for help, right? And I'm going to display some vulnerability, right? But I don't have the answers to all of world hunger just because I'm a senior executive now, right? Unless you can speed that getting through that barrier, man, it, I watch people flame out hard yeah yeah because they're unable to to yeah express that maybe i don't know everything today yeah no which is which is it it's it's i mean we we uh i talk about this all the time with friends peers colleagues whatever but it's you know that idea of of certainly a vulner of being being vulnerable enough to not know everything or to ask for help uh to have the confidence to understand um what 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 it, it's appropriate for like you couldn't possibly have known that so why right. why why would you struggle saying i don't know the answer to that um but but also um you know trusting those around you that they're not going to use your vulnerability in a way to i don't know politic internally or whatever the case might be it, it it's it's just some of that's just human nature and it's it's really up to leaders and organizations to drive the sort of culture where where it's okay not to know the answer and be vulnerable. It, it's empowering for those around you. At, at the same side, I mean, if you're a chief innovation officer, chief strategy officer, chief technology officer, whatever it is, there is a basis for what you do that you should have skill in. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was a lesson I learned very early in my career when, when literally I thought, in some cases I knew the answer, but I realized, or I was told, I was mentored, I was put into a room and yelled at, shut up. Like, you know, sometimes <laughs> you might know the answer, 
but that doesn't mean you need to say it. This is, right. an, oppor- this is a, this an opportunity to learn, this opportunity to ask questions, this opportunity to get people on your side because you're talking to them as opposed to not asking the questions because you know the answers, you know? Right. So um, I, I think that's, uh, it, that's, I guess there's probably a thousand books in the business section on that, but really those can only guide you through um, a journey because you got to learn this stuff on your own. I mean, yeah. sorry, you need experience yeah, to I really think, understand. Yeah, you know, the, and the experience that I think for me has been most valuable is uh, the experience of taking my lumps, right? Um, nobody likes to say we embrace failure because you don't want to fail, but the reality is, is when you, when you, you crash and burn, uh, and you get back up and you dust yourself off and you get back in the ring and keep going. There is a resilience, it, right? If you've gone through personal or professional calamity might be too strong of a word, but, but in any case, you've, you've taken your lumps on something. And if you can get back up and get right back in and keep going, there's a power to knowing that, right? They can beat the crap out of me, or I can crash and burn in an incredible way and I can survive, right? right? That knowledge and, and that, that inner strength of knowing that I have been through, you know, call it a job loss or whatever calamity that it's either personal or professional that you've lived through. Those people who have lived through it and gotten back up and, and thrived have an incredible power to take risk because they know that even if I take this risk and I crash and burn, I've been through it before I can survive. I've been through the worst that can happen. And it, and it goes back to kind of the stoic belief of maybe if I just work for a month and ignore all of these things in my life. So it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to live like a pauper for a month, right? These were stoic type exercises that, that people used to do to show they could live without, right? Or show you can recover from things it builds a resilience and strength to know that I can survive when things go. I think that our environment today, right, right now coming out of what we're going through in a global pandemic, regardless of how bad it gets or or right or wrong people were at the start of it, we're going to come out of this better because we have gone through some nature of calamity and survived and thrived or or a peace group of people are going to do that. That is where I think we can be a value to our, to the people we support. Right. No. And, and uh, especially given what we're going through today, I, I want to agree with you. Um, you know, uh, look, this is how you build confidence when you've been through these things before, or, you know, you're sent out into the forest with a compass and a hunting knife, can't come back for a week, Wh- whatever it was in the past, but but uh, it certainly brings it. But yeah, I think it's a it's a good note to end on. I mean, I would hope. I, I think there will be some good out of the 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 disaster that's going on right now across the globe, and um, and it, you know you don't want pandemics in order to create opportunities for change and innovation. But certainly not not on this scale. But. I think I think that's the human nature, and um, uh, and I think a great deal will come from it. Anyway, Chad, it was lovely to speak to you. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, well, thanks we'll for having talk me. all day, but yeah, yeah, and the best of luck, and you know, at at Net Impact, and I hope you and yours are healthy and enjoy this time in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Thank you With very your dogs. much for having me. All Take right. Care. Thank you for listening. I'd love to know what you thought of this episode, and I'm all ears if you have a guest recommendation. You can tweet at Network Disrupted, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or email me at andrew at networkdisrupted.com.